All right, everyone, good evening. We begin the readout tonight with the right-wing fringe that is just desperate to go mainstream. Between QAnon, the alt-right, the militia movement, and extremist groups like the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, and on and on and on, there is no question that extremism is on the rise in this country, and it poses a very real national security threat. But in fundamental ways, these extremists are choosing these maximalist fights to fundamentally change the cultural landscape in, in schools and on social media and more. And they are losing most of these fights. It's kind of counterintuitive when so many of us feel so freaked out and even frightened by what's happening in this country. But in small but really important ways, the culture wars that were won by those who want a multiracial, pluralistic society in this country are holding. This morning, we witnessed the statue of Robert E. Lee being hoisted up from its pedestal and taken down for good. It was the last Confederate monument to be removed in Richmond, Virginia, the former capital of the Confederacy, where it had loomed as a physical testament to white power for more than 130 years. It was the defense of statues just like that one that brought a horde of torch-wielding white nationalists to Charlottesville to defend those symbols of white supremacy four years ago. And despite the violence they meted out, even killing a young woman, Heather Heyer, in the end, they lost. The statue came down today. In fact, many of the leaders behind that fascist rally have had to face a rude awakening. As The New York Times reports, neo-Nazi organizer Richard Spencer is now an outcast in Whitefish, Montana, where he lives, unable to even get a table at many of its restaurants. His organization has dissolved, his wife has divorced him, and he's facing trial next month in Charlottesville, but says he can't afford a lawyer. Another organizer, Andrew Anglin, is MIA, following a 2019 judgment against him for $14 million. Well, extremists like them, who when Trump got elected, just knew that they could take their hate mainstream. While they're still dangerous, the Charlottesville Nazis' fate is proof that they can be beaten. The same goes for the army of chuds who stormed the Capitol on January 6th. Despite the trauma of that day and the lost lives, those insurrectionists ultimately failed to achieve their one goal of overturning the 2020 election and leaving Trump in charge. Biden was sworn in anyway. And the pardons from Trump? Well, they never came. So Trump's little army are getting prosecuted instead, if they're not in hiding or hiding behind their jobs in Congress. That includes one of the most recognizable insurrectionists, Jacob Chansley, known as the QAnon shaman. He's now repudiated the QAnon movement and pleaded guilty, and he's facing more than four years in prison while asking that he not be called the QAnon shaman anymore. Well, good luck with that. The extreme right is losing on other fronts as well. Despite their wild distortions over critical race theory, schools are still teaching anti-racism. Students are standing up to them. And CRT itself remains a part of college curriculums. And the book update of the 1619 Project is poised to be a bestseller. And while anti-vaxxers have slowed the fight against COVID, the fact is more than half of Americans have been fully vaccinated. And rates in some blue states are close to 70 percent. A large majority of Americans support vaccinations, and most would welcome vaccine mandates. These are small but encouraging signs, which is not to say we don't have a real fight on our hands. We clearly do. But that fight is being joined, and the majority is standing up. Joining me now is Tim Wise, anti-racism educator and author of Dispatches from the Race War, and Brittany Packnett Cunningham, host of the Undistracted podcast and an MSNBC contributor. So uh, you two lucky souls signed up for what's probably the hardest job in television right now. You know, it's sort of my Lord of the Rings call out to the rest of us, the majority of us, because I think everyone right now is feeling down, is feeling demoralized, is feeling depressed, right? But I asked the two of you on specifically because when you look at it, when you take a step back and you think about the, where the culture is, it ain't really moved. The, the, the alt-right never did create itself a mainstream movement. I, I, I definitely want to go to you first on this, Tim, because you have fought this fight before, so you know it's cyclical and it keeps coming back. 
You know, you fought against David Duke when you were a young man. He never did get to be senator or governor, right? So I think it's hard for us on this side to feel any hope because we feel like, oh, my God, we're losing. But am I wrong in saying that we need to take the small wins and re-energize re ourselves based on them? Well, I appreciate the, the attempt to look at the glass as half full. Um, I try to look at it as realistically as possible. You know, David Duke didn't win those races, uh, but that was never really his goal. His goal was to move the dialogue and the narrative farther to the right toward white nationalism and white supremacy. And in that regard, he won. Uh, he lost the election, but hate won that night because six out of 10 white folks voted for him and he moved the Overton window, so to speak, further to the right. So let's be clear, when a, when a statue of Robert E. Lee comes down only 130 years after it was put up and 156 years after the war that that man fought against this country so as to maintain white supremacy and enslavement, we can take it as a victory and we can take a victory lap. But then again, right, we have to be realistic because if Germany, let's say 130 years after the fall of Nazism, that would be, as I put it here, 2075, were to finally take down a statue of, of General Rommel, uh, I don't think the Germans would be celebrating and thinking, <laughs> my God, look what we've done. Of course, the difference is the Germans wouldn't have had a statue to Rommel, which is to say right. that they're far better at looking at their history than <laughs> we are. So I don't want to, I don't want to sort of rain on on the on the narrative that you're offering. You're absolutely right. Look, the vast majority of people in this country do not buy into this overtly hostile, bigoted white nationalism. But what we know is that, you know, Hitler was imprisoned for a while before he came to power. And the, the, the history of white rage, as our friend Carol Anderson at Emory has talked about, is a cyclical one. So we want to at least acknowledge that the majority don't buy into that, but acknowledge also that it's never taken a majority to push authoritarian or totalitarian or fascist and white supremacist politics. It only takes a very committed group of people, which these folks very clearly are. No, I, I totally hear that. And Brittany, you look, I, look, maybe it's because my name is Joy. That might be the problem, <laughs> right? Is that I, I, I try to find something in it, or, or maybe because I am just a Lord of the Rings person. And I'm not saying, that Frodo is about to like throw that ring in, in, into Mordor. But I'm saying we're at the part where he beats the spider, okay? I mean, look, I, the, the reality is that this is a long war. And, and, and I think about South Africa a lot, you know? And there's that song, there's something inside so strong, the higher you build your barriers, the taller I become, right? And I think about those South Africans, including some family members of Bob, their entire lives under apartheid. And if you ever get to the point where you say, man, we can't beat these sons of bitches, I, I feel like you already lost, right? And so I think of your fight. I mean, George Floyd, unfortunately, is gone, but they ain't going to ever get rid of Black Lives Matter. That thing is here. Yeah. Do, you, do you take comfort in that? Well, I take comfort in the data, right? And the data, as you've shown us, is that um, we are uh, more than they are. Uh, the data is that we can win when we set our minds to it. And the data, um, frankly, is that divine justice is on our side. So to, to your point, Joy, I look at the generations of freedom fighters globally who have taken on insurmountable tasks and have been victorious and use that as an opportunity not to pat myself on the back or to take a victory lap, but to give myself fuel for the next fight. Because yes. the truth of the matter is, we need the kind of courage and power that we are seeing on the grassroots to infect our leadership at every level. We yeah. see people like Zayana Bryant, who was 14, 15 years old in Charlottesville, Virginia, when she started, uh, along with others, the fight to take down the statues that we've seen come down in Charlottesville and in Richmond. We see Black commissioners like Tammy Sawyer in Memphis doing the same thing. We see people like Kayla Reed and uh, 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 Tashara Jones in my hometown of St. Louis trying to close a jail and doing so much work that people thought was impossible. And guess what? We need the folks that we elected to be just as, if not more, courageous. Because the problem is we are seeing a lot of people who are already suffering from the most oppressive circumstances, showing the most courage and bravery and taking on the most insurmountable fights. Meanwhile, we took on one of those fights in November and we overwhelmingly elected a party that we want to be partisan, that we want to stop trying to play nice in the sandbox with people who have clearly thrown out the rule book. 
We talk a lot about the hypocrisy of the GOP, and that's right. We should call out the truth of what they are doing. They're saying my body, my choice about being anti-vaxxers while effectively banning abortion access in Texas and trying to do so all over the country. The thing about it is, though, is that the GOP knows they're ridiculous and they don't care. They would love for us to keep talking about how ridiculous they are instead of fight them and stop playing the game that they want us to keep playing. So we need a president who refuses to sign an infrastructure bill until meaningful voting rights legislation is passed. We need a Congress who is willing to enshrine the constitutional right to abortion access through legislative action. We need folks who see all of these people dying from flooding and tornadoes and hurricanes, and we need them to read the room and pass real meaningful climate change legislation. We need for folks to recognize that poverty wages are no longer acceptable because people have found the glitch in the matrix and passed, at the very least, a $15 minimum wage. Scared power really is no power at all. And I see the power from the people, and the people are demanding that we see the power from our leaders.